mailbag time, Abby Barmore. Okay, first one. Which coach on the offensive side of the ball has the most pressure this season? Wow. Hmm. Hold on. Come I mean, on. you have to probably say Satterfield just because of he's kind of getting a fresh start with new quarterbacks, new receivers, healthy running backs, and now he's no longer coaching the quarterbacks. So what will that picture look like with him, with a new quarterback, and how much better can this offense be moving forward? All eyes on Donovan Rayola, too. I mean – there's not – I'm not saying – I don't think Satterfield's under pressure. I don't think he's on a hot seat, nor do I think Donovan Rayola is on a hot seat. But he has a veteran offensive line. We do this thing with the offensive line where we say there's really no excuses, and there's there's really not. Um, so I'd say I'd say Donovan and Satterfield are the choices. Mm-hmm. Right? And Satterfield, too, you know, when you – obviously the offense needs to be better, but he's inheriting that tight end room. And who's the guy with the most, highest potential – maybe on the entire offense, Thomas Fedoni. And you get Carter Nelson in that room too. Like you got some weapons to work with. How are you going to develop and utilize those? So I I would throw that into the conversation with Satterfield. Well, I'll put EJ Barthel in that conversation too. They need more production out of their running game. And obviously guys need to stay healthy, but take some of the pressure off your freshman quarterback and get that running game going, that traditional run game. I think Satterfield said something really important. I agree with you, Rob. Um, I think Satterfield said really something really important in Texas. He told us that that offense largely is going to go through the tight end, mm-hmm. and it wanted to last year. It just didn't have the quarterback to do it. I mean, frankly, um, they they struggled at the quarterback position. So that that Fedoni's going to get a lot of action. Borkerture, mm-hmm. who we leave out of the con- who I leave out of the conversation probably too often. Nate Borkerture, they'll go through him, and you want to see what the big horse can do too. Carter Nelson, get him going, get him going. All right, next question. On our mailbag post on Twitter, there's a lot of concern for Nebraska's 2025 class. So are you guys thinking there should be some panic there, or is there a way for Nebraska's coaches to kind of adjust their strategy to land those guys from official visits? I'm not really worried because (laughs) this roster already has a lot of young players. I mean, there's 80 players that are freshmen and redshirt freshmen on the 2024 Husker roster. 80. And 11 of them are offensive linemen. Um, but they, so they okay. need to continue to That's get, they, they point. need to get a quality group of around 20 commits and they're going to be, I have no doubt they're going to be at like 16 here pretty quick. 11 right now. Okay. 11 right now. Now there's no offensive linemen in here. That's what that raises concerns of some people. I thought getting that big from Galveston, Ma- uh, Malcolm Simpson was important. Mm-hmm. Um, but it would be good to see an offensive lineman jump into this. I thought I was sort of thinking the concerns were largely alleviated when they got Simpson, they got Jamarian Parker, um, and who else in a kind of short order? Is main, I guess it was mainly those guys in short order and Pierce Mooberry too. I thought they had that run, and I thought, okay, now they're cooking. So now they just got to kind of get cooking again to take mm-hmm. it to another. Yeah, line. I mean, and they, they don't need a huge offensive line class. I mean, if they can get three or four, they'll okay. be fine. Okay. Yeah, it'd just be good to see one jump in there right now. And in, in the in-state, we talked about this in the in-state front. There's, there's not like a no-brainer O lineman. I mean, there's there's okay. guys that will take a lot of development, and they've had, they've had them in camp, so they they have a good read on the in-state talent there. They just chose not to make an offer. See, it would help if there was a, a glaring in-state lineman that you'd say, oh, he's a no-brain, but there's mm-hmm. not. Like, if there was a Tyson Terry on the other side of the ball is what we're And talking. there might be one for 26 in Landon Von Segren. He Nebraska has not offered him yet, but he's picked up Iowa and a number of other offers this summer. I feel pretty good. I felt pretty good. I mean, like, when you talk about Makai Nelson jumping in, that I'm 20, he's 2024, 20, but newcomer. Like, I don't know. I just – I. I'm, I'm kind of with you. The The overall picture of youth is good, so I don't worry about the class as much. Do you see what I'm saying? Right, yeah. I mean, because it's impo- – I mean, to play as a true freshman in general is hard. Really hard at some positions. All right, next question. So is there a recruit in this 2025 class that if he commits, similar to Dylan Riola, there will be several other guys to jump on board with him? Dawson Merritt? Um, yeah, that's that's a great question, Abby, because I do think there's not like a no-brainer in that sense. But Dawson Merritt would carry a lot of weight. I do think getting Chase Lofton would be big for the future yep. um, when you start to talk about other Millard South players and other in-state players. Christian yep. Jones, too. Yep. I mean, I think those two guys locally yep. um, do Good carry point. a lot of weight 
with other future local prospects. But they, yeah, Dylan Raiola is a unique deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lofton is really important um, to me. I I think getting that sort of skill in the in the system is important. He's he just looks so good on film that. And then, then you pair him. I get it. Now, I know what you guys are thinking. Well, it's simple. They got plenty of tight ends. Yeah, they do. But you can't have too many good players. Mm -hmm. And and you pair him with a guy like Riola, and big things can happen. All right, Abby. It looks like we have time for one more question. Okay. Our last one. It was a record-breaking hot night last night, Monday, at the Cauldron Road Series final game. So what was the most uncomfortable game conditions you've ever experienced? Fresno State. Um, yeah, that was brutal. In Memorial Stadium, it would have to have been probably the 2013 Southern Miss game. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow, Sean. And 2013 Southern Miss, it was probably 110 on the turf. And I never had seen like the medical crews that busy at Memorial Stadium. And they had to come back to win that game, right? Mm -hmm. Wait a second. No, no, they won that game pretty handily. Okay, I, I, that was a Pelini team. Okay, um, God, that's the what game you go to. I thought for sure you'd go to Fresno. Well, Fresno, another that, that's a given. I mean, I think that might be the hottest temperature they they've ever kicked off in. At we, least it was late later. That's why they play it later. Yeah. There. But I remember, like, you shot your stand up that Friday before the game, oh. and it was like burning, like, literally, like, singeing my skin standing in the sun. Awful. Miami, when they went down there, remember how hot that sun was and the humidity down there? Yeah, September humidity in Miami, Florida. I mean, it's hurricane season. That was awful. So I, I, I'll, and that was a 3 30 game. Mm -hmm. That was in the peak. Eastern. Of Another one I'll throw in there Wake Forest, 07. Okay. Really? Is that bad? I was side. That was my one year. I did sideline reporting for the Husker Network, and Aaron awesome. Aaron Andrews was the sideline reporter, and we so we walked up and down that whole game together, and it was hotter than hell. It was hot as far as cold weather games. The Iowa game at Iowa when Burkhead mm -hmm. was the running back, and he had like thirty some carries. Yeah, and it was startlingly cold. The wind. Yeah, and I thought. I just all I had to do is walk from the press box to the locker room, but it involved walking across the field. And I wondered at one point if I was going to make it. And then <laughs> and and then I thought and then I thought these guys just played out here for three hours. Mm -hmm. These are the toughest human beings Toughen up. that you yeah, you can imagine. Because I I was I couldn't believe how cold that was. Oh, 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 six Big Twelve title game. Yeah, that that one's up there for sure. Oh, si oh god! I wore yeah. my gloves in the press box. Arrowhead. Yeah. And that that was the at that time the largest crowd in Arrowhead Stadium history. That oh, game was. That was hot. I mean, it was a. I mean, it was so cold. It was a hot environment, though, in terms of like intensity. It Over intense. sixty thousand Nebraska fans were in that stadium. Yeah, I and bet Oklahoma you, probably had twenty five. I bet you could find somebody who lost their fingers to frostbite in that game. I bet you could. The uh, Holiday Bowl. Remember, the only reason it was or like in finger. the thirties, but it was an open air press box, and it snowed. Yeah, the, freezing Washington, the Washington holiday. I was cold. freezing cold, right? Like, Open air press box, and it was cold. It was, yes, I was wearing my coat. You couldn't even really work at your seat after the game. And it was like spitting rain, so right. I had like the, the card, the roster card, like over my laptop as yeah. a little shield. I, I had a towel on mine. <laughs> yeah. Was it Qualcomm? Yes. Yes. Was that absolutely. stadium was a dump. Yes, that's why it's no longer being used. It's where the, it's where the Chargers played, right? Yes. And it's where the – did the Padres play there? No. no. They did not. No. Um, but anyway, yeah, those are those are interesting memories. Cold games. Yeah, they're hot and cold. We've been fortunate. You know, like in that opening year of Scott Frost, it was record colds where those were two of the coldest home games mm. in history. Um, the Illinois game and the oh, Michigan God, yeah. State game. Oh, God, yes. Um, those were two of the coldest on record home games ever at Memorial Stadium. Yep. I remember that. I was I in the Illinois student section for the Michigan State game. I had like three pairs of pants on. <laughs> It was Still terrible. Cool. It's like one of those ones where you just get a runza just so that you could hold it for as long as you possibly could good and then idea. eat it when it was cold. It's a good idea. You gotta bring <laughs> and stuff warmer. to warm your belly. When you're My doing buddy, yeah. um, Chris. Warm your belly. <laughs> was, if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. My buddy, Chris, was at Arrowhead for the Chiefs-Dolphins game this year, the one that was like miserably cold. Mm, and sure. he said, if you got a beer from the concession stand and freeze it froze by the time you got back to your seat yeah and that game i'm not joking around here there were there were reports of, of a lot of people who lost fingers mm -hmm. to frostbite yeah. in that game lost a pain 
smaller appendages, I suppose. <laughs> hey, we love, we love football in this country, baby. We're going to lose a finger to go to yeah. a playoff game. Hey, I'd give up a pinky for a playoff win right now. <laughs> no question. Would you? Would you give up a pinky? for <laughs> a Giants no, fan. Okay. A pinky for a Giants playoff Maybe, maybe another Super Bowl. Ah. I don't know. Wow. Okay. What? You wouldn't, you wouldn't lose a finger for a, your team's title? Which pinky would you pick, left or yeah, right? Left. Yeah. Fascinating. I would not do that. <laughs> well, there's commitment, and then there's yeah. good the rest typing. of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who uses your pinky? 